This is the second part of continuity, uh, the fourth sections of chapter two. So now we're going to talk about one-sided limits. So there are two uh, one-sided limits. The side uh, limits from the right and there's limit from the left. So limits from the right, right of a function f of x is notated using um, x goes to c plus, right? That means you try to find the limit of the function f of x when x goes to c from the right. For example, if I have, this is c, it's a point c here, and I have a function f of x, then this is when I try to find the limit of this functions when x approaches to c from the right, sorry. From the right. All right, a similarly limit of the function f of x when x approaches to c from the left is denoted using x to c to the negative. So if you see this notation, you know that we try to find the limit of the function f of x when x goes to c from the left. Okay. So from the left, you have negative, and from the right, it is positive. Right. And one-sided limits are useful when you're taking limits of functions involved radicals because the function is always, um, the, the function involves radicals just defined in a set of x values. For an example, if n is an even integer, then the limits of the functions square root of x root n when x goes to zero from the right is zero. The reason is when you have this functions x, y, and the function is always defined on the right side of zero. If you look at the left side of zero, the function's undefined. That means it doesn't make sense to find the limit of this function f of x when x goes to zero from both sides. All right. Now, when we look at this example number 10, the first limit is finding the limit of ln x minus two when x goes to two from the right side, from the right, because there's nothing from the left that we can find up. All right, so this is the functions, uh, the graph of the function ln x. And then in order to graph the function ln x minus two, you know that you have to move this original functions to the right by two units. So first I'm gonna draw a vertical line x equals two here. And then I'm gonna take this functions does it do it like this? So I'm going to just move this original function to the right by two units. So this is a function ln x minus two. Okay. And then you're finding to you want to find the limit of this function when x goes to two. What happens when x goes to two to the right from the right? Uh, the functions goes down to negative infinity. Okay, so you can say that the limits of this function either doesn't exist, right? It doesn't have uh, real values as a limit. Uh, either you can say the limit is doesn't exist, or later on you will learn that the limit of this function when x go to two from the right is negative infinity. As you can see, it goes down to negative infinity. All right, go to the next example. So you can see that if you look at this functions here, 
this functions, the graph of the functions is, is going to be one when x is greater than negative two. And it is negative one when x is less than negative two. And the function is undefined when x equals to negative two. So the limit of this functions when x goes to two doesn't exist, is that right? Limit of the functions here when x goes to negative two doesn't exist, but you ask to find the limit of the function when x goes to negative two from the left. So from the left, the function approaches to negative one. So the answer for this limit is negative one. Now that we learn when the functions, uh, limits of the functions exist, from one side, like one-sided limits. You can use that um, definitions or notations, or you can use that knowledge to uh, define when a function is continuous on a closed interval from A to B. So this is the definitions of continuity on a closed interval. A function f is continuous on a closed interval a to b when f is continuous on the open interval first and also the limit of function f of x when x goes to a from the right equals to f of a and the limit of the function f of x when x go to b from the left equals to f of b. So you have a here, you have b here, right? It's the functions, it's the interval. Uh, so you want to make sure that the limits of the function when x goes to a from the right equals to f of a and the functions uh, limits of the function when x go to b from the left equals to f of b. That's what it is. Now um, we can take a look at this example here we have a function f of x equals square root one minus x squared, and this is the graph of the function f of x equals two square root one minus x squared. We know that this function f of x is continuous on the open interval from negative one to one, right? And if we look at this graph right here, we know that the limits of the functions f of x when x goes to negative one from the right is equals to zero, which is the same as f of negative one. And the limits of the function f of x for, for x goes to one from the left is also zero and which is equals to f of one. So these are the three conditions for the functions f of x is continuous on the close interval from negative one to one. And the next sections uh, discuss, discuss the properties of continuity. So if again, if A and B are real numbers, right? And F and G are continuous at X equals to C, then um, the functions listed below here are also continuous when x equals to c. If you multiply b to f, right, you multiply a constant to a continuous function, then that function is also continuous. If you add the two continuous functions or subtract two continuous functions, then you get a uh, continuous functions. When you multiply or divide the two continuous functions, you also get a, con a continuous functions at x equals to c. Now let's do some more um, example on the continuity. Example number 12 has four problems. And then now we want to discuss the continuity of, of these functions. So we look at the first functions. This is the sum of the two function x and e to the x. And we know that the function y equals to x is continuous everywhere. 
the functions y equals e to the x is also continuous everywhere. So we can conclude that the function f of x is continuous also everywhere, uh, negative infinity to positive infinity. That's our conclusion. All right, let's go to the next example. This is the a function in the rational form, right? We know that the function x squared plus one is continuous everywhere. We know that cosine of x is also continuous everywhere. However, since cosine of x is in the denominator, this function f of x is continuous where cosine of x is not zero. So when cosine x equals zero, it's a special point that would make the functions undefined. So we want to find where cosine of x is not equals to zero, where cosine of x equals to zero. And cosine of x equals to zero when x equals pi over two plus n pi. So that means cosine of x equals zero when x equals two pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, seven pi over two, so on and so forth. That means the uh, general solutions for the, co the equation cosine of x equals to zero should be x equals to pi over two plus um, an integer of pi. Then from here, we can conclude that the function f of x f of x is continuous on everywhere, right? On the real number, but not at pi over two plus n pi, where n equals to zero, one, two, and so on and so forth. Next, functions, um, p squares functions, f of x equals to sine one of x when x is not zero and equals to zero when x equals to zero. Now we look at these functions, we know that the function f of x is defined everywhere on negative infinity to positive infinity, right? It's been defined everywhere here. However, if you look at the limit of this function sine of one over x, it does not exist. The limits of the function sign of one over x when x goes to zero does not exist because it's a, one of the oscillating functions. Um, because it doesn't exist when x goes to zero, then we can make the conclusion that the function s f of x is continuous. It's a continuous everywhere, but at x equals to zero. So it's continuous everywhere, but at, except when x equals to zero, or you can say that it's continuous everywhere on R, but not at zero. Big because the limit of the functions here doesn't exist when x goes to zero. All right. Next questions. So you have a very similar functions, but different. So this functions here equals to x times sine of one over x when x not zero and equals to zero when x equals to zero. Again, this functions here is defined everywhere. Is has values at everywhere. And also the limit of this functions here when x goes to zero is zero. And next thing is the limit of this function when x goes to zero equals to the function value when x equals to zero. So this function satisfy the three conditions for the functions um, to be continuous everywhere. The conclusion we can make is f of x is continuous everywhere. or continuous uh, on R.
So you might can you might uh, wondering how can I know that the limit of this function is here when x go to zero equals to zero? We can use um, Swiss theorem to show this, right? So the proof is you know that sine of one over x less than equals to one or greater than equals to negative one. All right, this is what we know. And then since our function is x times sine of one over x, then we multiply x to um, other components of this inequality x. And we also know that the limit of x goes to zero of negative x is the same as the limit of x goes to zero of um, x equals to zero. So by squeeze theorem. We can conclude that the limit of x sine of one over x when x goes to zero equals to zero. This is the proof for this limit.